They call us Gears. Our actual name is Paragos Long. They say it's a poem. The truth is that it's a song. We sing it in defiance of death and pain and the end. We leave our marks on this world because we know we will die ever so soon. I was meant to die two years ago. My natural lifespan see my organs fail, my bones shatter as generations before. But I replace my organs and lays my bones with carbon fibre. We transcended that fated death. We discovered automation and cybernetics and the glorious machines. We discovered the divinity that comes with them. They call us cultists. They're not wrong. My name is ventures forth bravely into great unknowns, and I am a worshipper of the machine. The world is a song and music. Electronic ears and synthetic eyes catch every light, every noise, every synthetic splash of colour in the beautiful world. It takes years of practice for Ventures Forth to not keel over in overwhelming awe, like an addict given a fresh hit every second of the day, as Milk walks away with a bottle of hard liquor. The music and light reflecting off clothes and machines blending together into beauty few can truly imagine. Cookie is singing in English. Venture Force's translator is off. She listens with a smile as foreign words flow over her. And as he roars something, the crowd roars back the unknown words. Primo Victoria. It's screamed out by dozens of voices and she can't help but smile. The music stops. The band is changing over and Forth watches quietly. She loves this, the watching. Seeing the world change around her and hearing people laugh is something she loves. When she writes her final song, she will mention these moments. She hears laughing and she steps away from the makeshift bar. Let people drink what they want. Let them fuel their inner motors with the oil of their choice. She joins the small crowd surrounding Cookie. Milk is nowhere to be seen. Ventures Forth holds out a glass of red grout, but he turns it down. I want to keep my mind clear, he says. She nods. Makes sense, she replies. Someone asks why he joined the shill. Isn't your home still transitioning? He laughs. Forth can tell his faults. Practiced. Polite. Not like the warm, quiet snorts of amusement he's let out around his bunkmates. Forth frowns. Lady, he says. Underway is the only way I know. It feels wrong to not have a plane or a ship. He laughs. A more real laugh. Forth goes to find milk. No, 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 no. See here, she says, stirring her words. The alcohol hitting her harder than she expected. The, the, the interceptor is all good, but it doesn't roar. There are no turbojet engines, no G magic, just all swoop and swoosh. Milk is arguing with someone over something. And the guns... The guns! No brrr, just, just zip. Arakiri laughs. I know, I used to have a beautiful rifle. Clean, sleek, chemical. They went bang and I loved them. I had to turn them over for laser when I joined. Not like bigs here. The nine foot tall lizard person nods with an affirmative growl. They got to keep their big shotgun. Lucky. Forth gets Milk's attention just as towards where Cookie has been swarmed by women. They both look back to see Cookie's face slip into a serene and painted on smile. A hand slips between his legs. His eyes dilate. Milk breaks a chair over the offender's head. It is true that musical theatre is some of the most beautiful things to witness as a gears, with your ears tuned to the music and your eyes tuned to the costumes, and your seventh sense seen it all, but a barroom brawl is almost as beautiful. Forth breaks her mechanical arm, punching out a cocky noble lady who wanted a piece of the new humans. She breaks her nose when the Rikiri the noble had been shaking returned the favour. They all wake up in the drunk tank the next morning. Drill Matron Senwin stood before the assorted group of cadets lined up in parade rest. None of them could pass inspection, even in the most lax of militia groups. And yet, here they were. So, she begins... On your week off, you decided to have a party. That's fair. You decided to provide drinks. That's appropriate. You performed some live music. Tasteful. And you sent a cadet of one of Orlon's retainer houses to the hospital with a fractured skull and another with broken ribs because they harassed one of you. She looked to the group of common-born bastards and outcasts standing in front of her. She had been given the shit class. 
The rest of Offcast nobody else really wanted to teach or monitor. Not bad enough to bar them from service, but never expected to do much more than collect a paycheck and retire after a tour. You have fought with your fellow patrol cadets, raise a hand against the nobles in your ranks, and are standing in front of me like drunken slobs. Selwyn begins to pace. I've been showing the medical reports. When you failed to keep your base tempers in check, the nobleborn had to call in their buddies and retainers, and you put them all in the hospital. Your class is one of the few who can actually stand for this morning's roll call. She stops, looking at each of the 20 odd cadets in front of her. Bastards and baseborn, destined for a ledger or a factory. A patrol ship of the rabble. She grins. I have never been prouder. There's a brief pause and glances of disbelief from all but three of the cadets. You showed those stuck-up, stick-in-the-tank cunt-sucking fuck-ups what a real patrol sailor looks like. You gave as good as you got and when the odds were stacked against you, you just fought harder. And all because someone messed with one of your own. She's still grinning as she walks the line once more seeing the scrappy pride of a true sailor begin to worm its way into these cadets' spines. I'm going to run you hard. I'm going to run you into the ground. I have to look like I'm punishing you, but I'll tell you. Right here and now, you've got exactly what it takes to be one of us. She takes one final look at the group, thin smiles pushing through parade's head faces. Dismissed. Get to the hangars in 30 minutes in full dress uniform. You've got cleaning to do. Draw Matron Senwin watched her class scrub the hangars clean, from top to bottom, in full dress uniforms. If they dirted their uniforms, they were to clean them before returning to clean the hangar. It was an old, traditional punishment, meant to teach the cadets to respect the uniform and service they joined. Semwin just thought it was another bit of idiotic cruelty that the nobility perpetuated. She wasn't a rebel, not in the slightest. She bled too much for her Imperium to think of turning her back on it, but she's seen how the nobility could get nearly anything they want because of tradition, or while the common folk were left holding the bill. This class, for instance. There isn't a single person of noble lineage in this class for one simple reason. They're all fighting for spots in the other, more prestigious classes. Groups like Duty Class, Zventa Class, or First Class, all filled with nobles and allies of the nobility, simply because those graduating classes had prestige. Each class was supposed to be filled with the officers who would make up patrol ships. The gunners, the sensor techs, the pilots, the comms workers. All intended so the cadets knew how to work with people outside their branch of studies. And in many cases, whole classes were simply assigned to a ship as their duty station. And then some noble noticed that some classes seemed to have more famous patrol members in them. And wanted their children to be raised among good traditions. And so the classes got proper names, funding and all the rich cunts fighting to get their slop roaches into their preferred class, leaving the common folks with nobody to fight for them, shoved into the classes with no famous aces, no famous martyrs, no glorious captains rising from them. Semum was nobility. She was born to a governor of a periphery system, and saw firsthand the sheer reek droppings people of her status could get away with. So she gave up her claim to nobility, and made her station by skill and merit instead of family name. Her wife, her pilot, was her equal and opposite. She rose from this very class to become one of the few Shulvanti interceptor aces of this modern proxy war with the consortium. She spat on the floor. She watched as a cadet rushed over and cleaned up the new mess as she watched the cadets run around, scrambling and shouting and scouring away the debris of maintenance and the static of life. And she watched two cadets who stuck close together, a woman and a boy, humans. Possible rebel sympathy, their file said. I wonder what my file says. Drill Matron Senwin, no family name, of the unnamed patrol cadet class muttered under her breath. The week ended quietly. All the classes had recovered from their drinking, their fighting and their fucking, and stood at parade rest in front of a hangar they had never entered before. The instructor stood in front of them. At their head stood the Commodore Patrol, she was a tall and broad-looking Shorvanti with one eye replaced with a glowing red cybernetic, one of her legs showing the faint discoloration of flesh cloning, and both her tusks broken like something was slammed into her face. She cut a harsh figure standing with her back to the sealed room. She spoke, and the voice that came out was quiet, soft, almost motherly, in sharp contrast to the harsh battle mistress body she sported. You all have passed your first year. A year of tests and trials and tribulations, and you have been given the chance to back out. She breathed in, 
a slight labour to the act, indicating her lungs weren't the ones she was born with. And you have not taken it. You have passed your first year of trials and tests, and shown you have what it takes to truly succeed as part of the patrol. She looks up and down the line. Most people there are shill, even more are female, but mixed in between the purple women there are Rakiri, Gears, Nagri, and a hundred other races and men and others standing at rest, a respectful sampling of the Imperium. You are heiresses to a long tradition. For 200 years the patrol has walked its path. From our beginnings as naval convoy escorts and customs agents to our crucible during the Fifth Roach Wars. We stared into the void and dared it to take from us those we protect. The Commodore's voice began to steady. The practice speech flowing out with a power behind it that caused all the cadets to stiffen up and stand at attention. The Empress gave our first Commodore a charge. The 24th Commodore spoke. She told her, My people are starving, and the enemy has attacked my convoys. The navy is stretched thin and cannot help everyone. I charge you to find 1,000 good women and shake them into my ages for the aid convoys. You will be my patrol, and you will not fail me. The one-eyed Commodore looked each cadet in the eye. For 112 years we have not felt this charge, and we never will. We are patrol. We guard. The Commodore turned on her heel and began to walk towards the sealed hangar as it began to open, revealing a darkened room that slowly began to light up. Floodlights casting away the darkness revealed walls full of bronze plaques, tattered flags and shattered armour. Glass cases holding uniforms and flight suits and blooded scarves. Whole support ships with battle scars crossing the hull, resting in eternal stasis. A memorial to the dead. But we are not perfect, and our job does not come without sacrifice. For every scrap of metal, for every corpse given a solar burial, there are a hundred, a thousand, who we will never be able to recover. Never even to know if they are dead. That is what you will know every time you go out to make sure a convoy gets through safely. She gestures up to a massive digital counter. Every few minutes, it would tick up a number. Sometimes it would go faster, sometimes slower, but it constantly ticked up. Look at this number. This nine-digit number. This is how many convoys we have escorted. Every time we see another safely to its destination, the ship sends a message and reports another success. And the counter ticks up. And when we are all dead and gone, atoms in space dust, that counter will keep rising, for that is our eternal duty. She looked at the mass of cadets, proud faced and straight backed, looking in awe at the massive number and the relics of the dead. Dismissed. I recommend you walk through our memorial and remember these names. They are your heritage, and you might one day end up with them. The Commodore turns and walks away, a faint tear falling from her intact eye. The sight of names she recognised on that wall being too much for her. Cadets Kennedy and McDermott have been to many memorials over their lifetime. From the sunken battleships off Pearl Harbour to the silent basement of the World Trade Center. But it never got easier, walking into a new one. The massive crowd of cadets just fell away as everyone walked silently, keeping a good distance from each other and taking in the memorials. From the hangar wall, half a kilometre long and a hundred metres tall, filled with small bronze plaques with a name, nickname, position, and date of death. Silent gravestones for those who gave everything. They walked past ships with holes clean through them. Metal polished to a shine by generations of cadets, running their hands along the hull. Flight suits blooded with every colour imaginable, sat in glass containers as generations of interceptor designs hung from the ceiling. The pair found themselves looking at a holographic display of an interceptor's rear wing. The display shifted and changed every few seconds, showing the wing art. Interceptor pilots have a tradition. When they get their first interceptor, they design an emblem for the rear wing as a way of identifying them by sight. It started off as vanity and boredom projects during picket duty, but because of the morale boosts, it was made an official practice. Pilots have incredibly high mortality rates in this job, and as the memorial expanded, a holographic table was placed off to the side, showing the wing art of every interceptor pilot who fell in the line of duty. From the fresh-faced cadets who got jumped and killed without ever firing her weapons on anger, to the hardened aces who met her match on a cold, dark evening, they are all here, and all given equal status. Some wings were recovered and mounted on the wall as further memorial, but for the most part, this holographic projection 
but for the only tombstone an interceptor pilot would get. Ryan Brooks Joseph Kennedy closed his eyes and placed a hand on the terminal for the table and whispered, Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. He pulled his hand back and crossed himself before turning to his companion. Ivy McDermott wasn't religious in the least, but she understood her partner's need for it. She nodded, and he nodded back. They moved on, going deeper into the massive memorial. <laughs>